And I'll say one one thing, which is always kind of a, a point of contention earlier on. So I went to the first conference by myself, this donor relations conference out in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the response was crazy. Like I was a carnival barker at the booth. There was like four people, you know, four layers deep at the booth. And I, I call the team back in New York and I say, $50 million, we're worth $50 million. I think we were making $12,000 <laughs> uh, uh, a year at that point. That's a cool and, moment. And I would continue to say that to, as you guys know, Jerry, by our, our CTO, I would say it often over beers. I'd say, hey, Jerry, 50 million. And he ultimately got very mad at me because he's like, there's no logic to what you're saying. You just say things and you think they're true. We ended up selling for much more than that so in some ways i just have to remind you know jerry at times hey we i was i was right there back in the day, though I had <laughs> it's on re it's on I, record I, the official i told you record. so all right we're recording a new episode of what works today we are joined by none other than jd bb jd a little bit of background he founded a software company called thankview that will serve the kind of donor relations space. He founded this company back in 2016. Over the course of five years, he grew that company to about 75 employees, if I remember correctly. And he merged with another company space called Evertrue in 2021, and then ultimately became the president of the combined company. Today, we're very excited to have JD here. And the topic we're gonna be talking about is how he did all of this bootstrapped. So he bootstrapped a software company. Bootstrapping is very popular today. Profitability is very popular today. More popular than it's ever been, <laughs> I think. Uh, and JD was ahead of the curve. He was doing this from day one. So very excited to have you here, JD. Uh, thanks for joining the pod. Profitability is good, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, hey, we all like making money. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, really appreciate being part of the conversation here today and excited to chat about our experience. Definitely, awesome. we love yeah. having you. We are too. JD, we, you know, we met you back in 2019. You were one of our early customers at HireFrame, actually. That's how we got to know you. But we kind of came in through like the middle, you know, the middle of that five-year journey. Could you take us back and tell us a little bit about the origin story of Think For You? And I'm sure that kind of overlaps with some of your background too as a as an entrepreneur. Sure. Yeah. I think by way of telling the the thank you story, I'll start even a little bit further back with the entrepreneur story. So Came up, started my career in advertising. I uh, started in advertising because I just wanted to come up with silly ideas. I thought someone told me that's what advertising was all about. And I said, ooh, that sounds fun. So made my way up through the ad game, became a creative director, and all along the way was always doing kind of silly little side projects. I sold fake beards one, one Halloween after the Hangover movie was really big. I said, you could be Zach Galifianakis with my fake beard. I sold love notes from John Hamm called Hamograms. <laughs> I had political themed dating sites. I had callobama.com. He'd leave a voicemail for Obama when he won his second term. A lot of kind of crazy, silly stuff along the way. But from the advertising, uh, my last post in an ad agency, I uh, got the opportunity to start my own ad agency, kind of on a Jedi mind trick. I had a client that was paying me uh, some nice consulting fees on the side. They said they wanted me to move to Boston. I said, you should hire my agency, which didn't exist. I threw out a number. They said, yes. And I grabbed my good friend, Keith Maneri, who is kind of central to my entrepreneurial story, said, hey, let's get out of here. Let's start our own agency. And from there, we ran New Antisocial for a number of years. We got Spartan Race Intel, the guy who started Firefest. That's the story for another day. He tried to rip us off for 100K. We got our money back. Um, uh -huh. So we did that. We we started um, another thing called BB's Butt Camp, as you can see here on my Shirt here that's a fitness class for your ass. Uh, it was one of the <laughs> most popular fitness studios in New York City for its tenure. Had a great time doing that. And that kind of finally brought us to Thank You. And Thank You is initially an idea that I had when I was getting married. I didn't want to have to handwrite the wedding notes. I thought it would be much more fun to do it with video. Couldn't find the solution. We built it for that purpose. I used it for my wedding. It was great. I got all my things done in two hours and drank a bunch of wine instead of cramping my hand. But all my friends, once we gave it to them for free, they said, great idea, and then none of them used it. So um, we were lucky enough to eventually pivot into the space you mentioned, donor relations, annual giving, aka you know, fundraising for universities and nonprofits because we kind of made the connection that they're constantly asking you for things, and in return, they're looking to thank you and steward you. We would learn that was the term they'd use a lot, stewardship. So from, you know, from my wedding at 2015 and then founding the company and really starting to go in earnest from 2016, that's what we did uh, up until our, our eventual merger and sale 
in 2021 was how can we help organizations of any kind, kind, but mostly fundraising organizations, say thank you in a more honest and human way. So that's that's what we did through the platform, and uh, it was a ton of fun. Yeah, I mean, incredible story. And I will say from this, the first second we met you, JD, it was very clear that you're a, I hate using this term, but it applies. You're a serial entrepreneur. I feel like from from butts to thank you notes, <laughs> virtually uh, video. Very, very, very <laughs> obvious to write, you know, linear path. Yeah, and I think that's definitely why we got along with you so well from the jump. Mike and I have always been, we're just, we can't turn that part of our brains off. We're always thinking of ideas. I know you're the same. As Mike alluded to at the beginning of the episode, bootstrapping is kind of all the rage right now. I, I, I was uh, fortunate to be a part of a bootstrapped success story before I started Higher Frame with Mike. So it's kind of the only thing I've ever known, but it is hard, <laughs> like really, really hard. And I know that now, as a lot of founders are considering as a very viable option in lieu of raising capital or having a super rich uncle, <laughs> um, I know that that a lot of people are interested in it, but it is quite daunting. I, do you have like kind of as you think about what made you successful as a bootstrap founder? Can you kind of chop that up to a couple of you know specific things? Sure. I think there's there's a lot of ways to answer that question, and I think. First off, and I think most central to anyone starting something is, is what truly is your motivation? Why are you doing it? Is it something that you are just compelled to be doing? It's something you can't imagine yourself not doing. I know in the case of, by the time we got to thank you, as you mentioned, the, the serialness of it is, I'd say it's less like, oh, I'm so great at doing this. It's just, it's all you know at a certain point. It's, 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 it's kind of like you need to breathe. It's the same way you need to continue to create things. So why are you making it? Um, and then as you're building it, certainly when you come to that crossroads of should I raise capital or should I not raise capital, question that too. You know, I think that the the thing that people can fall into is falling in love with the idea of being an entrepreneur versus really wanting to build something. So are you doing this because this is what an entrepreneur does and raising the capital and getting the right logos from the right, you know, VCs is what compels you? That, that could be helpful to your, your growth story, but if you fall too much in love with the narrative as opposed to falling in love with the business, I, I think that's kind of a, a fool's errand. I think that can get really get you trapped up. So when it came to thank you, the the aforementioned New Anti Social, which was the ad agency that was generating uh, a fair amount of revenue from it, as well as as uh, BB's Butt Camp, these things were all kind of cash flow businesses that we had running in the background. So when it came to actually bootstrapping our company, actively when I started New Antisocial, I, when I grabbed my, my friend Keith Maneri, who is one of my best friends from growing up and continues to be one of my best friends today, I actually said, hey, I'm giving you half the company, but we're gonna pay ourselves peanuts because we're gonna save all this money because this, this is not our last you know curtain call here. We're gonna be doing things in the future. So we always kind of had the intention of doing something else in the future and having a nest egg to build that off of. I think it's also helpful when you are younger and you don't have kids yet, or maybe you have a wife, but you know, your life is simpler before children and other things kind of start coming in and complicating it. Totally. So you're able to operate with less. So when it came to bootstrapping with Thank You, we didn't, you know, we put a deck together. I'll tell you, like we we went like, hey, let's go raise a half a million dollars. And I looked at it, I was like, why in God's name are we doing this? We don't need this money. We can do this ourselves. And I think in that, you just have to really focus on turning $1 into $2 or $1 into $1.05 or $1.01. Like that is the name of the game. It is not about massive hockey stick growth before. It is simply how do I turn a dollar into more, uh, you know, in economical ways. Totally. So I'll, I'll stop there before continuing to. No, on. that's uh, that's so powerful. And I do want to kind of hit on something there. So that uh, how do I turn $1 into $2, right? Um, I will say this is Mike and I both being bootstrap founders and also uh, having a number of different kind of call it like ways that we just make cash to survive. I am curious what your own experience was in ultimately saying, thank you, that's the, that's the, that's the ticket. That's the one I want to pour our resources into. Did you ever kind of think for a second that, hey, Everybody needs a nice butt. The butts are good. butts are never going out of style, I suppose. So I mean, I, I still like... I still believe that in my <laughs> in yeah, my but core, like, my yeah. heart, and my my rump. Yeah. 
Yes, but core. how did you think about that? And how did you think, you know, this is the one and we might have product market fit for this one? Yeah, so again, I, I, I feel as though I had a real kind of charmed existence there for a number of years and, and continue to today. I feel like I'm, you know, pinch yourself sometimes you wake up. But I had, you know, a successful enough agency with, with you know, it started with one team member and we ended up making that, a, we, we had a, a third partner eventually. And I had a, a, a partner in my then girlfriend and now wife that wouldn't get on me for having an atypical, you know, job. You know, my parents weren't breathing down my neck. Oh, you know, they, they'd question, what if this doesn't work? And he's like, ah, it's going to work. Don't worry about it. So it's always kind of, <laughs> then maybe I was batting it back a little bit and kind of being forced to question things. But by the time Thank You came along, we had a cash flow business that was supporting myself and, and others in a pretty meaningful way. We were paying for our own health insurance. We had the fitness studio that was working. That was, that was, uh, you know, kicking off cash. So, and I was in the late twenties, early thirties where it was just a lot of fun. And I was still stuck kind of in a, maybe a Peter Pan land a little bit of, Hey, this is fun now, not thinking very deeply into the future, but it wasn't really until thank you till we really started taking off with thank you. And thank you took about a year to spin up. Then it took us probably another year to reach uh, any level of parity in terms of how much revenue is coming in from Thank You compared to the other thing. So for a year or two years, there was a lot of overlap with us doing like three companies at the same time. We were going insane. We were getting on each other's nerves. But it wasn't until we started to see the profitability continue to go up and to the right and realize, oh, this, this model is completely different than the past too, right? So with an agency, it's great money. You land a big client. You have a, you know, big stipend they're paying you and you're like, okay, I can book, you know, half a million dollars on that client. What happens when the CMO, a new CMO comes in and says, I don't like these guys. I have friends over at my other agency. You're, you're, you're a stool in terms of an agency model. So you just get a few legs knocked out and the whole game's over. The fitness studio loved BB's butt camp, but you know, things come and go in waves too. You know, boutique fitness was huge. Then it went kind of out of vogue. And you can kind of see where that's not up and to the right. With software, you know, you create one thing, it serves a purpose that's going to serve purpose across a multitude of clients. And you're not rebuilding the wheel every time. You don't have to wake up at seven o'clock and go teach a class for an hour and then do another one at eight o'clock. You can just continue to sell the same software. And again, your margin is so amazing. That's when we started saying, hey, this has real takeoff potential. And, and I'll say one one thing which is always kind of a, a point of contention earlier on, we went to our first uh, conference. I went to the first conference by myself, this this donor relations conference out in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the response was crazy. Like I was a carnival barker at the booth. There was like four people, you know, four layers deep at the booth. And I I called the team back in, in, uh, in New York. And I used to say, $50 million. We're worth $50 million. I think we were making $12,000. <laughs> uh, uh, a year at that point. That's a cool and, moment. And I would continue to say that to, as you guys know, Jerry, by our, our CTO, I would say it often over beers. I'd say, hey, Jerry, 50 million. And he <laughs> ultimately got very mad at me because he's like, your numbers are based on, there, there's no logic to what you're saying. You just say things and you think they're true. We ended up selling for much more than that. So in some ways, I just have to remind, you know, Jerry at times, hey, we uh, I, I I was I was I was right there back in the day. Had, <laughs> it's on re it's on I, record. I, the official I told it's on you record. so. <laughs> no, exactly. Jerry, I can hear him saying that to you. I know yeah. his exact yeah. reaction. Like the right side of your brain. <laughs> uh, JD, yeah. I, I want to uh, you you talk about like these early innings of the bootstrapping phase where you've got an agency, you've got a fitness studio, different things. You're running around. You've got a girlfriend at the time and business partners. Tyler and I went through something similar and you, you mentioned it's, it was a charmed life, but I also know that from our experience, like that's a very like challenging time. And what I'll say is like, from our experience is like you are CEO of an agency and then probably 30 minutes later, you had to be CEO of thank you. And then you had right. to be a fitness instructor and then yeah. you had to go home and eat beans, uh, something like that. Can you, can you share what your experience was like during that time uh, for anyone who's out there who's in it right now so that they they might think like, okay, like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing or maybe they can course correct if, you know, their experience is not really oh, aligning with, with what, you're what you were going through. I, 
I can't say mine was probably the the healthiest. I'm a pretty spastic individual. I think I was I was always very high energy, so I was always kind of like riding a high, but the highs were high and the lows were low. It was, you know, you're you're constantly on the top of the mountain, then you're at the bottom of the valley. I found myself constantly kind of going up and down, but officially we had all of them. In the good moments, I just would say to myself, I'm just it was so exciting to be able to run from one thing to another and you're you're working on interesting projects you know we we had this this agency and we ended up getting clients for Spartan race it's the, you know this obstacle course race all around the world we got a client in Spain they said come to Spain so we go run in Spain we meet the 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 person who's running it in the United Emirates and he says you have to come to Dubai for the race so we go to you know we're doing all these amazing things and I'd always kind of lean into that the fact that I got to wake up and go teach classes I you know I became one of the instructors that at the fitness studio for a while. It was just a lot of fun. And I just tried to in the good moments, because again, they weren't all good moments, is focus on the journey aspect of it. I know that's kind of like contrite or simple to say, but it was it was fun. And it wasn't in nothing until really later in the later innings of thank you. I, I never thought about the outcome. The the You kind of, you secured a future as it were of, I have classes, the classes are filling, I have clients, the clients are paying their bills. That was kind of it. I was just focused on the here and now versus, okay, how do I make this agency the biggest agency in the world? That was never my thought. But once we got to thank you, that's when some of the, the you know, looking into the future and planning kind of came into effect. But I, I'll say there were a lot of times, yeah, did I like teaching classes at 7 a.m. on a Tuesday morning? And then running to, to you know running to the to the to the office and then going back at four o'clock or five o'clock to teach another class when I my butt is tired from doing this all you know all week. No, sometimes it sucked, but it I'll say sometimes I don't think I slowed down enough to even let myself have the thoughts of what what are you doing, and I think that might be true of a lot of entrepreneurs. It's almost like I hate to use the word, but like almost like a manic energy where it's like I just yeah. want to be doing versus. If I sit idly too long, then I, I have no function. I have no purpose. Yeah, that resonates a ton. I, I appreciate everything you just said. I, I think back to uh, a lot of things in our journey, Mike and myself. We, you know, before starting Higher Frame, one of the businesses that we had was we were doing brokerage of, you know, outsourcing services, basically, right? And I effectively was kind of the quote unquote, you know, CEO of sorts. I was the face of that business and Mike was, kind of the face of of a uh, higher frame and i just remember you know some of our most epic you know sort of fights were about the fact i was like hey man like i'm over here in the trenches and i'm getting yelled at about some stupid rfp that didn't get done in time and you're over there doing this thing and you don't know what's going on in my world and i don't know what's going on in your world so it was that but at the same time similarly had a lot of experiences this is nowhere like going to Spain for a cool, you know, Spartan race, something like that. But there was one time, Mike, Mike and I, we got contacted by, uh, was it like the Jizza? It was who was it from? Uh, from Wu Tang. Oh, it was RZA. RZA, RZA, the RZA, the Jizza, yeah. <laughs> the whole, the whole crew. Anyway, his company hit us up about getting some support with Higher Frame for like his Kung Fu Cinema Club. And I was like, dude, this is life. This is like, this, this is, is the that was, that was our like, moment. That was our, that was our moment. Mean, I was that's like, pretty we're, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah. So, so same thing. And I, and I, and, and to your point, I have always found when I do get into those valleys, I know myself and there's literally no way to work myself out of it without just getting busy. You got to, just got to get busy going somewhere. So yeah, that, that, that all resonated a ton. And, and I'll say too, I mean, I know, I know your guys' partnership is, you know, stood the test of time and, and I'll say <laughs> kind of underscore throughout this and anytime I talk about anything I've done it's it's you know it's through I'm the mouthpiece but I'm speaking on behalf of of my partnerships um, and I think that's the big thing because you're you're bound to get in fights you're bound to like like want to punch each other in the face every once in a while but I think that the sign of the best partnerships are can I can we like have those really hard angry you know moments and then can we rise above it and get back to work um, totally because I think you're you're fooling yourself if you think everything is going to be perfect with you and your partners. It's not. You're going to get into fights. You're going to get disagreements. Yeah. But I think it's really 
can you rise above that and understand and empathize like to your point hey i'm over here doing this you're not doing these rfps or reverse i i i, I empathize with that totally I yeah think that's that's really at the end of the day is do you have someone who's going to be there thick and thin once you once you go through that to say okay hug it out let's get back to work and honestly i've always said this about my partnership with mike i mean um i don't know if he feels the same way but i've i've likened it <laughs> very much to to my 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 wife and and marriage right in the sense that we haven't we still fight we've just gotten really good at fighting we fight and we there you go. we we the 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 retraction the revert you know the revert back to the mean that's that's we're just much better at that so i totally get that i will say so that's something that mike and i both always really appreciated about you and what you're building at thank you you guys had a motley crew and i think that you know that's one piece that i know from my past in uh helping to bootstrap a company we had a really incredible company culture i'm curious just to kind of bring it back to first your partners you know you you had keith it sounds like from the from the early days right you got Jerry somewhere along the way, but yeah, how did you kind of, how did the original nucleus form, and then how did that become a bigger kind of thing, right? How did that grow into this motley crew, thank you company culture that, to this day, your whole, all your alumni love that company, and you can see it. Really incredible group. Yeah, I'd say you know it started from that that first opportunity when we kind of weaseled our way or faked our way into having an agency and grabbed Keith. And I just knew, you know, knowing Keith from when we were 15 onwards, one of the most creative, you know, just in terms of designing an artistic perspective, one of the most talented guys that I know, just bar none um, in that space. So immediately knew, hey, and, and we'd worked on projects previous too, and he's a workhorse. When he wants to get something done, when he's good at it, He's, he's fantastic at it. So grabbing Keith and starting that, I think in those early days, what we also learned was Keith loves to be, Keith is fantastic at what he's good at. He hates doing things he's bad at. And oftentimes those were the, hey, got to wake up. We got it all hands at eight o'clock in the morning or there's <laughs> this accounting that has to be done. And I don't particularly like that either. And those were those early fights was was what those were about. That's when we introduced um, Mariah, who is our, became our third partner, Mariah uh, O'Krongley. She was Mariah Hutchings then. Uh, also someone we grew up with, much more business focused, much more by the book, dealt with the things, you know, leaned into the strengths where Keith and I did not have the strengths. And that's, we 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 got through New Ante Social and, and BB's Butt Camp that way. And then Jerry, I had come to New York from, from California with the intention of going to an agency where they had the developers in-house because I wanted to meet the best developers. And when you know it, Jerry was at the agency that that I landed at and we became good friends. And just, again, getting to know Jerry as a friend, but also just hearing that he was the best of the best. The fact that we were able, even able to get him, uh, he was severely underpaid when he came and joined Thank You. But I think he saw the same thing we did. It was going to be a fun adventure and kind of was down for the challenge. And from that, I think the in the best moments, we all fed into the fun side of things because the fun was the thing that kept on kind of opening the next opportunity was the silliness of, well, hell, why not? Why don't we do this? Why don't we build a, uh, a platform to help you say thank you after your wedding, which will, which will you know, morph into helping universities and nonprofits. Like, we know nothing about this world. So it was always uh, everything we approached from a, a perspective of kind of fun and a little silliness. And I think as we started to, to grow uh, the team internally, it always kind of came from a place of, well, where are the where would we want to work? What's the sort of culture we want to have? Because when you're the boss, as, as you guys know, at the end of the day, everything kind of starts from the top and goes down. So totally. the way you approach yourself and the working day is largely how people are going to start to approach it as well. So again, just feel very lucky to have had the partners and especially guys like Keith that are just so, you know, obviously silly. And then, you know, guys as Jerry, as you know, that are kind of undercover Silly, you know, kind of like the like the quiet, the quiet, silly on the low, cre- yeah, quick, yeah, quiet, crazy guys, Sne- like sneaky, silly, yeah, sneaky, silly, yeah. So, and Mariah as well. Like it was just, it was fun to, to have people that were willing to go that direction and not say, oh, well, we have to be serious. We're a business. It's like you don't have to be anything. It's this is all made up. 
Yeah, and you added yeah. you have, you obviously added a ton more people, and I think about people like Jose, who we love and worked with a ton, right? But how do you get like a Jose? Who, by the way, I would love it if you shared your story for how you found sure. Jose. <laughs> but how do you well, get him to to like fully buy in and treat it like he's you know effectively like almost a founder in the company? Yeah, I think you know. He- you have to in in the early days. I think the best hires, and I think the best hires generally are ones that are coachable, that want to learn, that are low ego, high kind of high energy or, or high fun. You know, very sponge esque in the beginning days. But Jose was one of our first three hires, and I'd say in the bootstrapping journey, certainly, I was the most probably of all the, the founders. I was the most cautious about hiring more people. I always thought it was going to be four of us because I just couldn't think bigger outside of myself, largely because I didn't want to drag anyone else into something that might not go go right. But once we decided, hey, we do want to do this, I started to think, having done thousands of the demos, because I did most of the sales um, for the platform, what were the things that really operated and worked well for me? And then what were those, those traits that I saw in others? And when I met Jose, he was the front man guitarist of my friend's band. He was... You know, for five minutes of meeting him in the parking lot as they're walking in, I think the first gig I saw them up in New Paltz somewhere, he's getting all the gear, he's calling everybody, he's calling the, the, the sound guy, the stage guy, he's getting everything set up, he's going out wailing, he's working the crowd, he's getting the tips. The guy was just a maestro, like he wasn't just a guitar player, he was a leader. And I think it wasn't until another show somewhere in New York City, and I'm kind of swaying around drunk with my beer in hand. I was like, this guy with rocket sales. Yeah. Um, and I approached him saying, hey, you think you'd ever want to be a salesman? And at that time, he was an electrician musician. He was working for the electrical unions. And he he wanted out. And again, just super coachable, friendly guy. And I think that's, that's largely how we tried to look at it from there. You didn't have to have massive expertise. You didn't have to know what you were doing as long as you were willing to be coachable, open, you know, largely positive and a, and a team player. I don't think we have a lot of mavericks who, you know, what do they call it? Like the, the, the genius asshole or whatever. That's the, a yeah. lot of companies want to avoid the genius asshole. And I think we were so lucky that we had so few genius assholes on our team. And I think that's what kind of led to this really tight culture because you really, you cared about the person next to you. You wanted, you, you know, when one rises, they all rise. It's not, hey, how do I be the the individual standout here? It's it's really, you know, we're, we're one for all. Yeah, totally. Mike, sorry, JD, I'm cutting you off. Y- y- no, we're um, we're talking about your partners, your co-founders, Jerry and Keith, and then the early employees. And you you mentioned something that we can relate to totally, where it's like you're cautiously optimistic about the business. You want to bring on new people, but you want to make sure you're doing it in a way that is respectful of, of them and their efforts and their time, their other opportunities that they might have, their livelihood, essentially, as I'll put it frankly. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about was like big investments. Like some of, as a bootstrap company, how did you go about making big investments? I think some of these were probably new hires. How did you think about investing in growth? Because you grew this business significantly, yeah. bootstrap. I, how did you balance like the growth versus you know making sure the company was in good standing? strong balance sheet. So sure. So so there was a few things. The exercise of paying ourselves nothing, that didn't just that wasn't just at New Ante Social that kind of continued throughout. So you know when <laughs> core <there's>, value. <laughs> you core value. Pay yourselves nothing for as, <laughs> as long as possible. Yeah, as long as you can keep going. Yeah. And that was always the thing, right? Like when there was four of us, I think we were paying ourselves sixty five, seventy thousand dollars for years. I forget how long it was, but it didn't it didn't go much up beyond that for for years and years there was money in the till so as though something happened or hey it wasn't as though we were destitute and on, on on the street but we really thought about how do we one minimize our the cost of of our services how do we offset that with the other companies when we had those but then it was really i'd say the largest costs were the people and we really thought long and hard about who do we actually need and why do we need them. And it almost always sprouted from pushing it to the limit. So when it came to to sales and, and hiring Jose as the first salesperson, that's because I basically, I started having no voice because I'd be on demos for, you know, eight, 
nine hours a day straight. Keith started stepping in. Keith is stepping away from doing design. He's starting to do a lot of sales. We're like, hey, that can't continue. We're starting to get so many clients. We can't uh, support all them through Mariah was doing our accounting and our customer success and the financials and all this other stuff. And that couldn't withstand. So I think we always tried to say, hey, how can we push this to the limit in the early days and really make sure we absolutely need this person versus, hey, this would be nice. I think as we got bigger, we did fall a little bit into that trap of, I will just, we have the cash, let's throw some money at it. We, we can do that. But I'd say backing up, we took a really simple look at it. We, we thought about the cost of every new person that would join the team. We'd break it up. We'd, we'd amortize it across you know, the 12 months of the year. Say, how much is this going to cost to the bottom line? Do we believe we'll add more than that based on our historicals? And I think when we talked last time, once we started getting a track record of knowing, hey, we should be able to generate this amount of money over this amount of time. The fact that we had a really short sales cycle, you know, 30 to 40 days, we get paid usually within another 30 to 60 days from that. We had a really good sense of cash flow. So it would just become a question of, you know, a new hire wouldn't be, say, $100,000. It'd be $100,000 divided by 12. Do we have the cash flow to, to, to support that? So that's really what it was. And I think the biggest kind of leaps maybe we took were our office space. Because at first, there's an office. There's four of us. We we're kind of like, you know, in one of the WeWorks, but we were like the glass like the glass yeah. box in the middle of all glass. The, the boxes. Yeah. Yep. So there was no window. Yep. So we were, and, and as you can tell, I, I was very animated and loud. We were, <laughs> we were, we were no one's favorite neighbors. Let me put it that oh, way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's me and Mike. So, You're talking so, to us. <laughs> so, so often we would, you know, we would see a new space and we might not be big enough for that space yet. We'd say, Hey, yeah. you know, instead of getting the eight person, let's get the 12 or the 16 person. And I'd say we continue to, invest there. And then in terms of trying to give it, you know, great benefits, like trying to pay for, you know, paying for healthcare, doing a lot of really, I'd, I'd say a lot of great things on behalf of our, uh, of our employees. It was also just making a really fun place they wanted to be and spend time. I mean, that, that's maybe not so different from big, big, big companies like the Googles and the Amazons or whatever, but in our own little ways, we'd always have, you know, a, a group meal at least once, once a week. We usually have things after hours. When the pandemic came, we actually gave people seamless stipends so they could, you know, have a meal on us or a few meals on us every week. So, I'd say where we invested the most, we once we absolutely needed the the employees, we made sure it was somewhere the employees wanted to be because at the end of the day, we we needed them to be successful for us to be successful. Yeah, we felt that. We visited, you know, one of your early offices. I don't know what version that was. December 2019. I don't, what, what it was in downtown. Was that? It was in downtown. You guys had a good amount of folks. It was like it was not a WeWork, but it was a WeWork like company. Yes, primary. That would have been primary. Yeah, yeah we had the big. We had a big corner office. I think at that. Yeah, moment. yeah. Yep. But, but uh, you guys were bursting no, from the seams, like you guys. Oh yeah, were... then we got another. Yeah, then we got another one, and there was like the yep. sales room down the hall, and I'd walk in, and people would be playing Super Smash Brothers at three o'clock on a Wednesday. I'm like, do we work around here? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we know that. Um, but uh, yeah, we felt we felt we felt that investment. Everyone, you know, kind of just had that had they have that thank you feeling, uh, family to them. I guess is what the feeling was. Um, but you did make, I will say, as a as an outsider who watched your company grow. What I was always really impressed with was the level of branding and specifically, you know, the thank you, I guess, for lack of a better term, the commercials that you guys would shoot. And and, and I'm really curious how you thought about that, because I, you know, I, I, I'm not I obviously through working with you guys, we, we know a little bit about your space, but I don't know all your competitors. I would imagine they're not doing those. <laughs> so and that had to be. Oh. You know, yeah, like how did you kind of think about we're going to make this investment? And also, I would say, like, it really is a was an advantage to you guys. You guys were just so strong in that area. Was that something that you realized, like, hey, we're really good at this? And, you know, this could be a great thing to put some money into, even though our competition is not? Well, first of all, thank you. Yes, I, I, we, this all kind of comes back to we just like doing it. And it was like, hey, <laughs> yeah. this is fun. And, and I think we had the advantage of having had an agency where your entire thing is branding and all you're focused on is the creative and how you're positioning against your competitors. So 
we kind of came in with that strength. And again, Keith being as strong as a designer and artistically minded as he is, it was central. You know, I think if you if if you look at most founding teams composition, it's usually not sales guy, quasi, whatever I was. I was just kind of like that was that was the 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 face, right? Uh Keith, branding guy, designer, one developer, and then, you know, one person on finance, uh, support, success. It was a weird composition to begin with, but I think that's what led to our success because it was always kind of central to the decision making. How do we position ourselves? What do we look like? What do the ads look like? Even though the space, it was almost better that we didn't know how the space operated because we just <laughs> right. we made our own assumptions about what had worked in other spaces. Because, you know, I, in addition to making all the creative, we had also done ad buying hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of ad buys to drive business across these different clients that we had. So we just got really lucky there. And I think from the, the video stuff, as our teachers in high school could attest to, Keith and I and our friends were always making dumb videos. Like that's <laughs> also kind of like bedrock of, of who we are as, as people. And I think it was as much fun to us. And it was almost like, um, it was almost like a treat for the team at times. Be like, hey, we're going to throw, you know, let's put together a, a script. Let's go shoot this thing. One of the guys, the, one of our early employees, John Dotteridge, was a great editor. So it was kind of a fun thing that the whole team could kind of get involved with. And once we saw that the response was as good as it was, which, again, who doesn't, who doesn't love kind of silly, fun stuff? Once people started realizing, oh, you're that, you're that company, you realize it's, it's all doing the same thing, whether you're impressed by something you've heard in a webinar or whether you saw a fun video and now you're intrigued to talk to us more. All roads kind of lead back to you know what we're trying to do with the company, and if you can't if you can't have fun when you're working, what what are you doing? That's that's ultimately kind of what it comes back to. Totally, and I almost liken you guys to. I always thought of you as kind of like the Mailchimp of like your your space, and I just remember from my day starting off in marketing, and the founder of the company was like, "You got to pick a you know a newsletter." product right and i would look at uh what's the other one custom constant contact, contact. constant contact that's the yep. one i look at them and i look Super at mailchimp dry. yeah and i'd be like i'm not you know constant contact i'm a mailchimp guy I'm like fun, i i'm the fun one i'm the yeah. cool i'm the cool <laughs> guy you know yeah yep. totally so did you find that with your with your customers as well as they kind of were like you know we want to be on your side of the aisle basically yeah i mean you know in in, in the Thank you. Ultimately, had a unicorn logo, <laughs> uh, a mascot, Uni the Unicorn. The yep. backstory is not great there. Other than that, we wanted to start infusing some more fun, create these characters, add some levity to the site. And once our designer kind of created this this unicorn character, we're like, oh yeah, that's that's the greatest. And I think initially <laughs> when we were doing our, our rebrand, the designers were trying to you know think them think think their way out of a paper paper bag. Of, oh, how do we make this cool thing, this, that, and the other? And we're like, hey, we all like the unicorn. Put the unicorn in the logo. Yeah. And, you know, the unicorn ended up being a fantastic branding element because, one, you can find unicorns everywhere. Two, who doesn't love a unicorn? It's fun. It's whimsical. It's magical. It kind of embodied all the things that we wanted to be. And, yeah, and, you know, th that that ended up leading to having a lot of standout, too. You know, again, you, you go to a, a fundraising technology conference for higher ed fundraisers it could be a little dry so the fact that you're the one there and you have unicorns and you do these fun giveaways and again as you as you as you referenced jose people on the team would come to embody this this same kind of feeling so it was yeah you wanted to be with us you wanted to be with the cool kids and I, i'd say we always had the most fun and had the biggest smiles on our face totally That's awesome no i uni you, the unicorn that like <laughs> it's, it's just so outstanding. Like on, that's what I think about when I think about Thank You. It's like the yes. unicorn logo. Um, yeah, fantastic. Um, switching gears here, if it's okay with you, JD, I'm I'm curious to understand how you, as the co-founder and CEO of Thank You, how your role evolved over time. You know, year one, two, three, four, five, and then and then how your role, you know, what your role became at EverTrue. Um, that's something Tyler and I are in, in the midst of right now, you know, yeah. we're four or five years in higher frame and we're, you know, it's an ongoing conversation of like, what, you know, what should our roles be? What should we be focusing on? How is it different than before? What are we working towards? So curious to understand how you thought about that and, and what you experienced. 
Sure. And, and I'll just preface that I don't think I did it terribly well. Uh, there, there's the way to do it, and then there's the way that I did it. Um, <laughs> I think in the early days, again, you were just, it's all exploratory. You could be wrong at every turn. Obviously, we were wrong. We pivoted a number of times. Even there were pivots between the the weddings and, and higher ed that we don't need to get into. But you're just, you know, you, you, you have a vision. You try to explain it well. And I think kind of storytelling in, in my line of work anyway, that, that's always been, I think, one of the, the things I've has gotten me through, kind of like uh, helped me overcome some shortcomings, is how can you have a vision and share it? So in those early days, do your co-founders agree with, with what your vision of the company is? Can you illustrate it? Can you tell them why certain things are? So I'd say the first year was just, here's the vision, here's why these things do the, what, what they do, having a lot of back and forth, being very collaborative. And once the product was there, it was, can we find the right way to position this? Can we find the audience? Can we create the, the product market fit? And that that has a whole bunch of different storytelling. Because again, we, we had to kind of morph the story a few times. And once you find it, recognizing that the way this is going to be successful is if you are doing more listening than you do talking, which I know seems surprising. I did I did listen occasionally, but was really kind of focused on, okay, who who are these customers? What do I know or not know? And how can I learn as much as possible and then it morphed right into sales mode. I think for the first three years, it was go, 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 be the face, listen to the client, relay the feedback, and just hammer, tell the story and perfect the pitch. And I'd say that was probably like the golden age of me because again, I I tend to, I, I tend to be a smaller thinker than, I, than I'd like to admit, where it was very easy. It was clients come in, I show them the product, they say yes, I pass them on. And it was like this, you know, very fulfilling moment as part of the company. But as a CEO, obviously you have to become bigger than the individual contributor. So as the team got larger, one, teaching different departments, you know, learning on the go, how does customer success work? How does sales work? What should we be doing with marketing? Trying to infer a lot of that to the team and ultimately empower people. You know, as I mentioned with with Jose, he, he was a close friend, another early sales person, Alan Pierre. He was also a friend. I think largely a lot of what things come down to is how do you how do you hire? How do you empower people to then be essentially spokespeople for the company beyond you? Because again, you, you have to it has to become larger than you. Where I'd say I failed, I stayed in the weeds way too long. I was down answering support tickets occasionally, you know, digging very tactically into the business. And I think at times I was even a little bit afraid because of the the way our, our founding team worked. I almost didn't want to stick my neck out too much. I thought like we make these decisions versus I make these decisions. So I think at times I probably should have tried to be more of here's the vision and, and, and come from an I perspective versus a we perspective. I know that's a, a little bit of a weird thing to say because I do think we as a co-founding team operated very well, but sometimes when you're the CEO, you have to there are just those things you kind of have to step in front of the train or pull the train forward at, at, at times. And I don't think I did that as well as I could have. And then ultimately, when it came to the sale, that's, I think why I like that too, is I got to be sales. I got to put the sales hat back on. Brent Brent Grinna, who was the CEO and continues to be CEO at Evertrue, we made a fantastic sales partnership. We got out there, pitched the hell out of the, the shared vision. Super fun, didn't sleep for like four four months, kind of lost my mind at the end of the sale, but <laughs> got some good sleep. And um, and then, you know, coming together, what I think I, I, I did find in the partnership with Brent was I wanted a hierarchy because at that point, again, I it had been so much we, 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 which again, worked for us. But in coming together with Evertrue, I said, I, I want there to be a, a, a very clear chain of command. I want you to be the CEO. I want you to make the call. Yeah, I want to be your confidant and I want to argue and disagree with you. But at the end of the day, you you, know, you say jump and I say, well, how high? Like that, that there, I like the idea of having a clear line of command. And so I, I held a number of different positions there. I was at, I was the president. I became the head of product. I got to learn a ton. I feel like I, I probably learned more under Evertrue than I did in years elsewhere. But yeah, I, to su summarize everything, Ultimately, I think the best leaders do figure out how to get out of the day-to-day -day or find the right people to 
empower them to do the do what needs to be done and think bigger picture. I think we hired fantastic people at Thank You. I think we started. We had we had fits and spurts of um, seeing what what the the future could be, and and I think that the team really did buy into that. When we did it well, it worked fantastically. I just wish we'd done that more. I wish I had been a little less afraid to to step back and think big. Sure. It's scary, even if you're the CEO. Sometimes it's scary to to think like, well, who am I to to think I know what's going on? It's fundamentally different too when it's a bootstrap company. There's just this feeling where it's I don't know how I'd liken it to like you're building a castle made of like wet sand, and you're like at any point this could go to zero. That's like yep. how you feel emotionally. So it's just a totally different way of building a company. I I want to um you're going through all that kind of evolution, right? Like as like a like a business person, a leader, a company builder. And that's all happening while you're having kids. <laughs> I'm really curious. This is where I oftentimes use this podcast very selfishly. I am a dad who is every day I feel like I am totally fucking lost. <laughs> so I'm trying, I'm just trying to balance how do I be a dad? How do I be a good founder? And I, I have a very specific question to ask you because I'm curious. You had you you had your your first, right? While building the company. But no one else had kids, right? I know Jerry didn't have kids, but what about Keith? Keith, Keith, Keith would have a kid uh, about a year later. So he, okay. I think Sienna was twenty twenty. Yeah, so okay. it would be a year after, um, after Sunny. Yeah, my, my daughter. And that's uh, so. This is a very specific inside baseball question to ask you because something Mike and I have gone through. I, you know, have a daughter, and 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 Mike has one, fortunately, on the way. But uh, we've had this gap where I've been the solo dad parent of this founding team and uh it's hard i don't know if you ever found like it was hard where you know you're being pulled obviously away and uh kind of they're having to probably do more of the share of the responsibility at certain times i don't know what was your own experience i guess with that and how did you manage it yeah i think i mean a kid no matter what changes changes the game whether you're the co-founder or you're just a you know an individual contributor at, at a company one you're sleep deprived so you're kind of <laughs> already kind of woozy most of your waking hours anyway and i think there was always that feeling of i th i think the the parent always maybe feels it most acutely like oh geez i'm falling down i always knew with with my partnerships i always felt like i w was i ever carrying my my equal weight was i really kind of pulling my weight. Um, sure. I felt that <laughs> from day one till even today, it was like, did <laughs> I, did I actually do enough? Did I earn my keep? Um, and I think that becomes more exaggerated when you have kids, but I think it's, you know, you have to start becoming a little more, um, stringent with your time. You know, you, you, you don't have, you can't stay up and work until forever. Uh, I think the other partnership that, you know, gets lost in this often is, partnership with your your spouse you know um totally. i know my wife was not happy with me for a lot of that first year of of you know because you're adjusting to being a parent you're yeah. adjusting to sleeplessness they are too so i think there was a lot of challenges in those those early days but as again i think you have the, the right partnerships you just speak open and honestly about what you can or can't do you figure out how you can pick things up where you can pick them up and I think if you found a good distribution of the workload as a as a founding team, and you start to build that team, because that's that's the nice thing too. When by the time I had uh, we had Sunny, the team was 20, 30 people deep. So when it came to sales, marketing, success, I had it wasn't just my founding team. I had people that I can lean on internally to say, "Here's what I need to do," and that's where again I think as a leader, you really start to succeed when you explain your vision, you set expectations, and you hold people to account. Those are things that I, I again, if I, if I have another opportunity to do this again, I think I want to be even stronger in that in arena, is how do I set expectations, not only for my, my partner, but for my whole team? Because these things are always going to come up, whether it's a, a birth in the family or a sickness in the family, or, I mean, life doesn't wait for anything. And, you know, thankfully, the, the rest of my co-founders have gone on to become parents themselves and you know what they may have seen is like frustration at that point maybe they kind of see oh i see this so i think sure. again this comes back to my my 
my stress on on the right partners. The right partners understand what's going on, and if you're the right partner for them, you'll also figure out ways that you can try to make things back. Um, but a kid is always going to change things. And that's in a positive way. I think it's oh oh where to go. I oh. still see you. We still got oh. you. We still got you. Where did I yep. go here? Oh, sorry. No <laughs> worries. Weird little thing popped onto my thing here. Um, By yeah, way, I think that timing I think was you... perfect because you're talking about kids, and that's a classic kid moment. I mean, that was your computer, but it's like yep. that. That's a you know what I mean. It's like, and uh, what was I saying? That's I found myself saying <laughs> yes, that yes, all the time as a parent. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I think I'm, I'm I'm starting to ramble with my answers. I'm trying, no, I'm trying to keep no, it more no, no, concise no. here. No, 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 it's it's uh it's awesome. And I will say to Mike's credit, this is one of his superpowers. He's really good about he observes and he learns from others. He's watched me <laughs> stumble, fumble, and just completely make a bunch of wrong yeah, turns. He's gonna have loan, but he's, he's yeah. good about it. He's like he's taking notes. He's like, hmm, so daycare is essentially a center for disease. Essentially. Yes. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah, taking yeah, notes. He's like got his notepad. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely a privilege to, you know, Tyler and Christine, you know, a couple of years, had a kid a couple of years before us. So there's so many learnings there, right? Just to see how Tyler <laughs> and is able to navigate it all and figure it out. And I get to learn from, learn through his experiences too. And that's actually what we're doing here today. We're learning from your experiences. Honestly, I'm sure you can, yeah. the, the conversation has become a, uh, a Q and A for advice that Tyler and I are seeking. So appreciate this that. Is- that therapy you're doing couples you didn't know you're our, <laughs> our couples therapist here for your um, I'm ha- happy to help fellas <laughs> <laughs> and i would like to work on my butt after this so we can just okay well, we can do that too yeah like give me a couple oh, well, yeah, yeah. yeah you I'll send you a picture you, and you can let me know uh <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> lost cause what i need yeah, what yeah. i need to work on <laughs> um you alluded to it but uh, i figured this would be a good way to kind of um uh close things out here you alluded to if I you said if I get to do it again, so this the the serial entrepreneur um, JD, you know what what are your kind of what are, what are your thoughts on what's next for you? Would you start a software company again? Like what? <laughs> yeah. Open any question, right? Sure. So I mean, I think just as and I'll use our I'll use our outline here. So I'll set it up this way. <laughs> I think reflecting back on the past eight years of uh, <laughs> growing the company and selling the company and and kind of seeing you go through these different iterations. What is most important and continues to underline for me is who you're doing it with. I've done a thousand different weird things and it doesn't ultimately what you're doing doesn't matter as much as who you're doing it with. Because to your point, how do you create great culture? How do you do these brandings? How do you stand out? It's largely fueled by the company you keep. So as I think about the future, I'm more focused on who can I do it with? It doesn't matter what the thing is, whether it's software, whether it's a physical product, whether it's a a service, it truly doesn't matter to me. And I don't have that thing at the moment, by the way, there's my brain is a smooth egg. There's no good thoughts (laughs) flowing through it, but it really comes back to whether it's Keith, whether it's Mariah, whether it's Jerry, whether it's other friends that, you know, I have the same sort of conviction and they have the conviction in me that matters more to me than what I'm doing. So if I, and I say, if I get the chance to do it again, it's almost largely based on if I have the opportunity to spend that much time with, you know, close friends and building something together, then that's, that will be a blessing. That's what I want to do. Um, that's, that would be the dream. I mean, yeah. That's and awesome. I love that. Knowing the company you've kept before, I totally get that. And I know it's hard to kind of distill these things down to a couple simple bits, but You've touched on a bunch of stuff, but what would you, if you met a younger JD today, who's like, "Hey, I'm, you know, I've got these ideas. I want to start a company. I want to be a founder like you." What advice would you give, you know, younger JD? Just start going and be super energetic about it. Again, don't focus on the outcome. Focus on the process. I think that's where I fell in love with doing this stuff, and ultimately, kind of became that person that was almost like, I I had no other option than to start stuff because you just start to see what's possible when you just can do it yourself and no one tells you no. And it's a sickness. It's like a disease. You just like, well, I got to go do this now. And for all the things we mentioned, the successful kind of fun things, I've had a ton of stuff that didn't work. I've had 
so many things that did not work or were moderate here or a dumb waste of money. Like if I go back, I owned, I owned 300 costume themed URLs at one point. I don't even know how much money that was. It was like, <laughs> I didn't want anyone else on the internet to have a good URL for Halloween costumes. Amazing. Dude, stupid stuff, you know, wasting tons of money. But I'd say if, if you want to do something again, think about why you want to do something and do you have the conviction to, to stick with it? And do you have the right partners? I, you know, again, I applaud you too for having a great partnership. People that I see go out and do it themselves. I don't know how they do it. The mental load of a single founder lifestyle seems literally impossible to me. So I'd say, do you have people you can trust and they're going to be there for you through thick and thin for a decade or more? Do you have an idea that you really believe in? And do you have the energy for all the ups and downs it's going to take? Because I think, you know, as you build a company too, you need to keep everyone else energized. And I think that's totally, if I were to say, you know, one of my secret powers is I just, I really enjoy doing what we do and it's, I can be super enthusiastic. And I think the more you make others believe that's how you, you know, that that's, that's that, uh, exponential growth opportunity because you, the only way to get really, really big is to get other people to buy into what your vision is. So those would be all the things. Do you have the right partners? Do you have the energy? Do you have the wherewithal? Are you in it for the right reasons? And do you like the process? Because if you if you don't have those things or you're missing one, you got to focus on that because oh, I want to be rich. Well, there's a lot of ways to be rich and starting a company usually isn't one of them. There's The, the <laughs> failure rate is way too high. So you, that can't be the reason you do something. Yeah, you can just go Billy McFarlane, do do Firefest. If you really yeah. want to be rich and you're willing to just roll the dice and we'll go to maybe jail go to for a few fed. years. Hey, you club know? club fed though. Club fed is That's true. Pretty nice. You're in there with some good company, I suppose. Yeah. Um <laughs> No, that that was great. Uh and then Mike, you want to kind of land the plane here, you know, yeah, I, I know no, I, this has been I think I'll just speak for us. This has been one of the best episodes we've ever done. So I think oh, you thank get, you guys. They're going to get so much from this JD. Thank you. In our pre-call, we talked about the unsexy part of bootstrapping or just what unsexy means to you. JD, could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that's when you choose to not go the route of funding. Funding obviously allows you to have more cash on the balance sheet and to make decisions like, do we have a big office? Do we do some big splashy marketing campaign? Uh, when you're bootstrapped, every dollar matters and you really have to live essentially at least the way I we ended up doing it was kind of a threadbare existence right so your your co-founders being my co-founders as I mentioned we really didn't pay ourselves very much and we did that for years and years and years and when there were tough times we tightened the belt we you know the last 11 months before we did the sale uh, none of the found you know none of our co-founders paid ourselves a salary so we we took no money from the business there were times we took you know the, the little money we did take from outside sources were bridge loans with incredible uh, interest rates on them. So that was that was nice, but we did all these things with the assumption, yes, we're gonna pay for it or we're not gonna pay ourselves or it's gonna be a, a, a tighter time, but it was all in furtherance of the company. And I think when you're building a bootstrap company, so much of what you do is gonna be unsexy and you really have to figure, am I doing this for the customer? Am I generating the revenue to keep the lights on with the team that I have? And do I absolutely need anything new that I that I introduce to the mix? Because every dollar that goes in your pocket is a dollar that doesn't go into the business. And if the business goes under, it doesn't matter how much money is in your bank account because now you're, you know, your 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 dreams are dashed. Yeah, I think those are such important points to hear uh, over and over again. Right now, where we are, it's uh, January 2024. Um, this has never been more important advice, I think, and just insights on on what's important fundamentals of a business. Uh, I think that's just um, really great to point out today. Cool. And then transition here a little bit to just wrapping things up. JD, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation and sharing all your insights. You talked a lot about energy today and how you, the energy fueled thing for you and into Evertrue and into your team. And I would just say like the energy that you've given us today on this call is just like infusing me and totally. probably Tyler too to go out and run through some walls. So we always get yeah. that feeling when we speak with you and I appreciate you coming on. Hell yeah. Well, thanks yeah. for having me again. I, I, I always appreciate talking to you guys.
We love having you. And uh, I know that you're, you mentioned finding that company, that not, not company like that you would start, but like the people, the people that might join you. If someone's out there and they're like, I got to work with this dude, what's your preferred way that they find you? Is that like LinkedIn? Is it, you know, I don't know what's your preferred sort of yeah, channel. Yeah, drop, drop me JDBB on LinkedIn. Shoot me a message. I'm I'm always on there. I'm a I'm a bit of a, I don't know, like a cringy LinkedIn guy. I do thankful Thursdays. You know, I like to, I like kind of being a little bit more earnest or open on on those platforms. So, LinkedIn. Hit me up there and happy to chat. I'm always excited to meet new founders, people that are just getting going, people who have questions. The lines are open. Amazing. Awesome. I Thanks so much, JD. Expect someone to hit you up. Thank you, JD, for your time. This has been awesome. Thank you.